Hello, this is Jeffrey Kleintop, Chief Market Strategist for LPL Financial, with our outlook for 2012 that we've entitled Meeting in the Middle. 2011 was a year of changing conditions. We saw sun and clouds, meaning it wasn't a bull market, it wasn't a bear market, it was more of a squirrel market. It was jittery, ended up going in circles, and it was full of nuts. What I mean is that the S&P 500 is ending the year not far from where it began, yet stocks rose or fell by more than 1% during nearly 40% of the days in 2011, with an exact split between the number of 1% up and down days. And these swings are nothing new. Over the last four years, the markets declined in excess of 2% in a single day around 100 times. More than any other four-year period since the S&P 500 index's formation back in 1957. On the flip side, the market also recorded a 2% or greater gain in a single day more than any other four-year period. While well, the last few years have been highlighted with record swings in market returns and wildly oscillating economic data, we expect 2012 will be less about the fringes and more about the middle. The market and its economic backdrop may begin to migrate from the extremes toward a more normalized period where investor sentiment, economic activity, and the market's direction all start to move increasingly in alignment. Recently, we've experienced a market of extremes. In 2012, finding a middle ground or meeting in the middle is going to be key for growth in the markets and the economy. On the economy in 2012, we believe soft sentiment and hard data will find middle ground. We expect the U.S. economy to grow about 2%, which is below the consensus forecast, while emerging markets post stronger growth and Europe experiences a mild recession. We believe there's a 1 in 3 chance of entering a recession in 2012, and this leaves 2012 more likely as a mid-cycle year of continued, though sluggish, growth. However, many investors fear the U.S. economy is poised for a business cycle much shorter than the average of 8 years seen in recent decades. This fear of a return to recession just 3 years after emerging from the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 is driven by largely the concerns over a lack of job growth and the fiscal budget and debt problems here in the U.S. overseas. It's created a huge gap between sentiment, which is very pessimistic, feelings if you will, and the facts or the actual economic data here, particularly late in 2011, which has been pretty solid. Now we recognize the challenges posed by unsustainable government budget deficits and relatively high unemployment rates, we believe the support of strong business productivity and a corporate spending boom are being overlooked by investors. It's also worth noting that job growth is now in line with the past two recoveries at this stage. Uh, it's actually not weaker than average. It's actually right in line with the average. So let's turn to the stock market. In 2012, stocks are supported by a converging outlook for earnings growth. The U.S. stock market is likely to post a high single-digit to low double-digit gain. Supported by earnings growth and a boost from a slight improvement in valuations as the pessimistic outlook for profits reflected in the markets rise to converge with a slide in the lofty expectations for earnings projected by Wall Street analysts. Now, it may seem odd that stocks can perform well when the global economy is sluggish, but over the past 40 years, the S&P 500 median return is 10% when real GDP growth is less than 3. So it's important to recognize that the S&P is not GDP. S&P 500 companies have different drivers for earnings than the components that drive GDP. For example, two-thirds of S&P 500 profits come from manufacturing, while two-thirds of U.S. consumption and GDP is actually services. And a much more significant percent of S&P 500 earnings come from business spending, rather than discretionary consumer spending. And this is really important when international trade, it only accounts for about 10% of GDP, and it actually acts as a drag since we import more than we export here in the U.S. But say about 40% of S&P 500 profits come from overseas, with about half of that coming from very rapidly growing emerging market economies. In fact, according to the IMF, Emerging markets will grow to 50% of global GDP in 2012, 
they're becoming much more important than the slower growing developed economies of Europe. Even with sluggish GDP growth, we expect mid to high single digit earnings growth for S&P 500 companies in 2012, and that should help support solid gains for stocks. Moving on to the bond market, we believe the government and corporate bond yield gap is going to narrow, and bond yields will actually rise overall, with the 10 year Treasury ending the year around 3%. Ongoing economic growth is going to help to help to lift interest rates, and so too will the ongoing actions of the Fed and stable inflation. Corporate bonds are likely to outperform government bonds in 2012, the opposite of what occurred in 2011. Finally, major policy-driven events will converge on the financial markets in 2012. We believe a mild recession emerges in Europe, in contrast to the consensus forecast for continued growth. But ultimately, we believe European policymakers will muddle through 2012 and continue the reforms begun in 2011, such as new governments passing budget cuts uh, and ensuring banks have adequate capital. These efforts have helped to take a financial crisis off the table, evident in the sharp decline in bond yields in Europe in late 2011, but the progress on the debt dilemma they face is likely to be uneven and contribute to market volatility in 2012. In addition, the elections in 2012 in the U.S. are likely to hold major consequences for investors. In 2011, the markets disliked the uncertainty and all the bickering among a divided Congress. The elections in 2012 may bring a new Congress with a mandate for action and enough control by one party to accomplish it. The key fight this election is over those in the middle. While those that identify with a party are unlikely to shift allegiance, independent voters are the swing factor. For example, as of mid-December, 79% of Democrats approve of the job President Obama is doing, while only 9% of Republicans do. In the middle is the independent voter, whose approval rating of the president's been fading and now stands at only 39%, according to Gallup. So the battle's really around that middle 39%. Now, historically, the four-year presidential cycle of stock market performance has been driven largely by changes in stimulus to the economy. And these changes are evident again this cycle. In fact, the S&P 500, again, traced much of its average performance during the presidential cycle. However, there's been a deviation in the pattern. And this year, we've seen stocks... Uh, in mid-2011, kind of dip below the, the classic pattern of performance. But stocks have begun to close the gap, but they're unlikely to reconnect with the historical pattern of performance entirely. But as we look to next year, it would seem, based on this pattern, looking at the chart, it probably get a flat year for stocks. But what's important to note is that while it's true that the first three quarters of a presidential election year are usually pretty flat, the fourth quarter is not and it tends to break out one way or the other. Looking at just the year four pattern, the market breakout was to the upside in 1992, 96, and 2004, and it was to the downside in 2000 and 2008. Most often, the breakouts to the upside is the uncertainty surrounding the fiscal and regulatory policy environment resolves. But in 2008, well, there was a lot of other things going on as the global financial crisis erupted uh, that uh, lowered that long-term average to affect the fourth quarter dip. The 2012 election is likely to be very consequential for investors. Congress is unlikely to pass a major deficit reduction bill before the 2012 election. The party that emerges in control following that election will forge the decisions that will represent one of the biggest shifts in federal budget policy since World War II. While it's still early, it appears that the GOP will regain control of the House and may pick up enough seats to take control of the Senate by a modest margin. Having both chambers in the hands of one party greatly increases the odds of policy action. But regardless of the details of the plan or how we get there, and we've seen a lot of proposals to choose from, blending a mix of tax increases and spending cuts, most proposals phase in the impact, so it isn't until about five years from now that the full impact would be felt. The cuts would likely be equivalent to about 3% of GDP, or about 14% of the federal budget. This would be one of the biggest shifts in modern U.S. history. 
As we look out to the next few years, the old adage that the market likes gridlock or balanced government between two parties may not hold. It's apparent in recent market performance that investors recognize that substantial, defining fiscal policy changes, difficult to forge in a divided Congress, are needed. And we'll be watching as the election battle heats up to gauge the market impact of what will likely be a very consequential election year. I hope you found this overview of our outlook for 2012 valuable. We've also published a detailed white paper on our forecast for 2012 and encourage you to review it for further insights. Thank you for your time and for your business.